And we're with uh, former Defense Minister Moshe Boghi Alon, also former Chief of General Staff of the IDF. Um, Mr. Yalon, we're all hearing now about the attempts to resume the nuclear talks between Iran and the world powers. And there's a general feeling that seven or eight or even ten years of Israeli policy vis-a-vis -vis Iran have failed. Iran, as we're being told, is the closest it's ever been to a nuclear weapons capability. Accusations are flying between the current government and leaders of the previous government. What's your take on this? No doubt that Iran has become to be the main generator or instigator for instability in the Middle East. With its fingerprints in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Iraq, undermining the Sunni regimes in the region, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, and, and more. The whole idea is to export, export the revolution, and they need the nuclear umbrella, first of all, uh, to be able to intensify their activities to export the revolution. Uh, I would claim that, uh, you know, I follow the project since the 90s, serving as head of the intelligence, the military intelligence in Israel. Uh, if, if nothing has been done, I believe there will be even in further uh, uh, progress in, in the project. Those so they would have had nuclear weapons by now? I'm not sure that they have made the decision to have the nuclear weapon, but to become a threshold mm -hmm. nuclear state, they are there. Looking back to the policy in the last uh, decade or so, the main mistake was the withdrawal of the U.S. administration from the JCPOA, which was an historic mistake, the JCPOA. It would have been a very different agreement, but it probably was better than not having the agreement and to allow the Iranians to use the withdrawal as an excuse to go ahead with the project. And now, yes, they are in the closest stage that they have been ever to become a threshold state. So let's just rewind to May 2018, when the Trump administration decided to withdraw from the JCPOA. I think it's fair to say, with, uh, if not pressure, then a lot of encouragement from the Israeli government, from then Prime Minister Netanyahu. That, you think, was a mistake? Once they signed the JCPOA, it would have been better to stick with it? It was a mistake, for sure. I claim it even before the decision. I published an article about it, a warning that uh, the United States should in hand withdraw from the JCPOA, even trying to have the coalition, which was in the Obama administration, to have the P5 plus one, to have Europe with you, China and Russia on board, which was the case in 2010. They voted for uh, uh, sanctions in the UN Security Council. It is given now. What should have been done now? It's not a lost case. I don't claim this. we are now in, in the, they across the uh, uh, point of no return. I claim that this regime, Khamenei, in two cases in history, when he met the dilemma whether to go on with his rogue activities on the nuclear, as well as the missiles, as well as the proliferation of terror and arms in the region. When he met such a dilemma, his choice was survivability. What should have been done now, this is my recommendation, political isolation of the regime, creating a new coalition in order to reach this uh, objective, crippling economic sanctions, to include China and Russia. But it China is possible. But doesn't seem to be very interested and, in playing in this. And to have a credible military option. US one. Israeli one. That was the case in 2012, when Khamenei has to apologize when he decided to be engaged with the great Satan America. I claim it is still possible to reach it, but it is up to the U.S. administration policy, namely U.S. determination, not to allow a military nuclear Iran, which is of course, the Israeli objective should have been the European objective, no doubt, of the Arab regimes in the region objective, and the United States. It, the United doesn't sound, it doesn't sound that the Biden administration has a credible military, specifically not after the debacle in Afghanistan in August. So far, I'm afraid that you are right, Angel. I'm afraid, you know, not to respond to the Iranian provocations in Iraq, the Iranian provocations against Saudi Arabia, in Yemen, in Lebanon, 
you know, but it is not a lost, a lost case. You know, the Middle East has been changed dramatically. There is no Israeli up conflict whatsoever. There is an Israeli-Palestinian conflict, a marginal one. The main problem in the Middle East is a struggle between three radical movements for hegemony in the region. It's not about a Western hegemony or external hegemony. It's between the Iranian Shia regime to export the revolution, to have a Shia Middle East in beyond, the jihadists claiming for Islamic Caliphate, and, of course, Turkey, which claims to have a neo-Ottoman empire led by the Sultan. In this case, all of us, we and the Arabs, are on the same side, on the same boat. This should have been the case with the United States, Europe, and other uh, adversaries in the region, I believe. So basically, David yeah. Ben-Gurion's uh, alliance with the peripheries has been inverted, and now the peripheries, except Israel, are on the are facing Israel and the Arabs together. Absolutely. You are absolutely right. And when you see Israel's role in this, so you, you mentioned the, the Biden administration has to be more, uh, more forceful in presenting or projecting the possibility of a military option. What does Israel do this time? Does Israel remain quiet? Does it shout? Does it resort to quiet diplomacy, clandestine activities? What would be your recommendation for the new government? Holding very big stick and uh, soft talk. Speaking very softly. That's it. And I believe, you know... Because when, you, when you were defense minister, Netanyahu went to Congress to challenge publicly Obama on, on the JCPOA. I I, that wasn't something that you thought was a good idea at the time. I wasn't happy with it, because at the end, the relationship between Israel and the United States is a cornerstone in our national security. And we shouldn't fight the Americans. Uh, we should cooperate with the Americans. We should convince the Americans. This is the case now. I believe that the new government in Israel understand it. And that's why we have now all kinds of talks on the very high level, on the military level, intelligence level. It's very, very important. But we don't have the same kind of confrontation between the prime ministers that we had between Obama and Netanyahu. You, you think that's a better case? That's good news. We should be on the same side with the Americans. We might argue. I'm not happy with the Biden administration so far regarding the policy in the Middle East, the disengagement, the withdrawal, the way that we withdrew from Afghanistan. But we have the way, the channels, to discuss it and to convince, from my point of view, the Americans not to disengage with the Middle East. If you Run away from terror, the terror will reach you. Let's shift our focus a bit closer to Israel's borders, to Syria. You as defense minister was one of, were one of the leaders of what was then a quiet uh, war in, with, in, Iran, uh, sorry, in Syria against Iranian entrenchment there. We've been seeing in the last few weeks uh, almost a love fest between some of the, what we call the moderate Arab uh, regimes, the ones even close to Israel, have started to re-welcome Bashar Assad into their midst, into the Arab family. How do you see that panning out? I worry about the new contacts between the Sunni Arab regimes and Iran. It reflects the fact that they understand the United States is not going to play a significant role in the region. It is worrisome. Regarding Assad, it is given. You know, Syria is not going to be reunified anymore. Now we have in, on, on, on the Syrian soil the Alawites led by, by, by Bashar al-Assad. We have the ISIS elements all over. We have uh, Turkey on the northern part. We have the Russians uh, deploying over there. And unfortunately, we have the Iranians. So it's an ongoing struggle in which Israel, in a very smart way, we don't allow it. Uh, I'm happy that we have we don't claim responsibility for any activity. After you left the defense ministry, they started to take <laughs> I was very critical to it. You know, you can. But it's now a fact. If this, you want to is, shoot, shoot, don't talk. But, we, but, but we're now 10 years, by now more than 10 years after the, the civil war began in Syria. And, Arab, and we both remember the intelligence assessment saying Assad will be gone within weeks or months. That wasn't Assad, my assessment. Okay, but a lot of the, the intelligence of people who you had appointed 
we're, we're saying that. And now we know Assad is there for the foreseeable future. Can, can you see a future in which even Israel is, is dealing with him, like the Emiratis and the, and, and the Jordanians now are? The main objective and the, main, and the interest of Israel as well as the Arab regimes not to allow Iranian presence in, in Syria. And if uh, Assad is there... Despite and, everything that's happened in the last 10 years and the hundreds of thousands of deaths under his regime, in the end, you know, there was an opportunity to Obama at the time uh, to attack Bashar al-Assad, and uh, the it was zig red, the red zigzagging line. as yeah. the red line. It was and, and another mistake, you know. The U.S. strategic posture in the Middle East has been harmed in many cases, not uh, responding to Houthi's attack against uh, U.S. Mason, a, a, a U.S. Navy yeah. a, a frigate, Recently, not uh, responding to, to Mercer Street. Iranian militias, uh, UAVs attacking uh, the uh, uh, U.S. deployment in Tanef, as an example, or the Green Zone in Iraq to include, uh, try to assassinate uh, Prime Minister Khatami. If you don't uh, uh, respond in, in a way, in aggressive way, you might be seen as very weak, and the, in the end, the Iranians will have more provocations as a result of it. And into that vacuum, which, which is being left by, you said, the American posture no longer being as forward projecting as it used to be, has come Russia. And that happened on your watch, Russia deployed to Syria. Do you think this has changed the balance here, or it's not a, it's not a major deployment by the Russians? It still is something small just to keep Assad uh, on their side? It changed the balance in, in, in Syria to keep uh, but do you Bashar al-Assad. But regarding our interest, you know, we have found a way to coordinate the activities with Russia. It happened in my uh, watch as a defense minister when I realized on September uh, 2015 that they are going to be deployed. I called uh, defense, the Russian you. defense attaché to my bureau in Tel Aviv, and I said, you have your own interest, we have our interest, we are not going to harm yours, don't harm our interest, and, and it works. As you know, till now there is a channel for coordination between our headquarters and the Russian headquarters in, in, in Syria. You know, in many, it is so complicated, I, I'm not sure that the Russians want Iranian presence in, in, in Syria. So. We share a couple of common interests with the Russians as well. So, very quickly, because we're almost out of time, you mentioned the, the fact that there's no Israel-Arab conflict, there's an Israel-Palestinian conflict, and that's, you said, almost a side issue. But we saw in May how, with Gaza in, in flames, East Jerusalem and many of the mixed cities within Israel were being gripped by violence, that this side issue can suddenly gra gr grasp the agenda back again. You're not, uh, you're not concerned by that? You think that that's going to remain a side issue? I'm concerned, but uh, this is not an existential threat for the state of Israel. And I don't want to go to what has happened in May. In many cases, I claimed, claimed and claimed that uh, our behavior allowing to the Israeli extremists to act in Sheikh Jarrah, in uh, Temple Mount, uh, in the uh, cities like Lod and Acre and, and Tiberias. So I believe that Israel is strong enough to deter Hamas, to deter Hezbollah. But you know, the main, uh, the epicenter, the core for instability is still in Iran. And but you said that you used the word existential. Is there an ex existential threat to Israel? Or is even Iran, because that was part of the argument, perhaps the core of your argument with Prime Minister Netanyahu, how existential a threat is Israel facing? Are there any existential threats left? Today, there is no existential, external existential threat to, to the state of Israel. But if Iran will have a nuclear, military nuclear capability, it will be a new Middle East, not in the right way and not for our interest. That's why the Israeli objective have been, should have been, should be not to allow a military nuclear Iran by all means. Moshe Elon, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for yeah. watching.